depend on their depend on their acorns and the, the insects that they, they produce. There's a lot of mammals, uh, rodents, bears, raccoons, possums that depend on, on oaks. A few uh, reptiles. There are several butterflies that special on oaks, but there are hundreds of species of moths that depend on oaks, as well as the predators and parasitoids that, that, that use those moths. Cinnipid gall wasps depend on oaks, lots of beetles. Uh, then there are a number of, of uh, spiders uh, and other arth arthropods, mollusks, and annelids that all depend on the, the leaf litter that, that oaks create underneath that tree. Point is that this diverse web of life that's associated with oaks is typically unnoticed and therefore unappreciated by people that have oaks in their yards. And that's exactly why I wrote this book. Um, it is a month by month guide to the life that occurs on your oaks. Uh, so that you can you can learn about it. Uh, you know, I, long ago I learned that knowledge generates interest, and interest often generates compassion. Uh, and we need an awful lot more compassion towards the natural world than I have right right now. So that was the goal of the book. First, uh, a few facts. The genus Quercus contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. Uh, the word Quercus comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. So oaks are fine trees, and they are indeed. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus. In North America, there's the, the white oak group, we call Quercus. The red oak group, we call Lobate. The live oak group, Verentes. And the canyon oak group, a much smaller group, Protobalanus in the west. Uh, this is the distribution of oaks. So everything except brown has uh, at least one species of oak in it. The white is one to three species. Um, what, 15 to 20 species in the dark green here. So the, the uh, southeast is the center of distribution of oaks in, in our country. But uh, most areas of the country have uh, uh, at least one species of, of oak. Oaks live a long time much longer than people think. Uh, the average life cycle of a healthy oak is 900 years, 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods, they are contributing unique ecological services to the land around them. The oldest oak that we know about in, in the country in terms of a single tree that people would recognize is the Middleton Oak, uh, a Southern live oak in Charleston, I believe, uh, 1500 years old. But recently, uh, they have found out that a palmer oak in California is actually 13,000 years old. And it, it's that old because it keeps cloning itself. Um, it dies in one section, but has rooted in, in another section and just keeps going and going and going. So oaks do live a long time. This is the Y oak. It's, it's not there anymore, but it's from, uh, it was the biggest white oak in the country, lived in Y, Maryland. I got to see it before it fell down. Uh, so oaks do get, get large. Uh, and you know, that's, that's most people's impression. But one of the things I wanna talk about tonight is that there are some small oaks uh, that are appropriate for, for use even in small properties. So every oak doesn't turn out to be a giant. Another theme for tonight's talk is that oaks have superior function, superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, and we'll talk about what that means. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide, pulling it out of the atmosphere and building their tissues out of it. Uh, and then equally important, they're pumping that the extra carbon they fix through photosynthesis into the ground through their root systems. Uh, so we've got to get that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, they are the best soil stabilizers because they have the largest root systems, the largest canopies, the largest uh, spread of leaves on the ground. They make the best leaf litter, meaning that it, it lasts longer than other, other species, and all of that promotes healthier watersheds. I start the book in October, and people say, why'd you start in October? Because that's when my wife put the idea in my head that I should write a book about oaks. And I looked out the window, and that's what my oak looked like in October. Uh, so I said, okay, let's, let's start in October. And October is, is a month, of course, when all those acorns are, are dropping. It's the most noticeable thing about uh, oaks in the fall are those acorns. Uh, and they make a lot of acorns. A single oak can produce 3 million acorns in its lifetime. Uh, and of course, acorns are large, nutritious nuts that uh, provide an awful lot of energy for an awful lot of creatures. A lot of rodents depend on acorns. I'm going to admit here. 
Uh, a lot of mammals in general, uh, black bears uh, really eat a lot of, of acorns. Uh, and of course, the familiar ones, uh, the, the uh, squirrels in our yard depend on acorns and those cute little deer eat a lot of acorns. A lot of, of uh, birds that depend on, oak, on acorns as well. Turkeys um, gobble, yes, yeah, they gobble up those acorns in the fall. Uh, but things like uh, red belly woodpeckers, uh, titmice, towhees, um, nuthatches, flickers, they all eat a lot of acorns. And ducks particularly the wood duck. They really love acorns. Any acorn that falls in the water, the ducks die for them and they'll come out on the land and, and uh, eat a whole bunch of acorns. <clears throat> a lot of invertebrates use acorns as well. This is the acorn weevil larva tunneling out of an acorn. That's what it looks like as an adult. There's a group of moths called acorn moths and they all look like this. There's several species, but they're hard to tell apart uh, that develop inside acorns. So, after a few weeks uh, on the ground, after the acorns have fallen, this is what it looks like under an oak tree. Most of the acorns are gone or crushed or eaten, not much left. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce with all those things eating the acorns. And this is where the uh, relationship with jays comes in. It's a very ancient relationship, a mutualism between jays all over the world and oaks all over the world. Uh, they both, both those lineages evolved about the same time in Southeast Asia, about 65 million years ago, so a long time ago. Uh, and right away, they, they found that uh, they could offer each other some services. So oaks, of course, offer jays those acorns uh, for winter food, uh, and the jays take advantage of that. But jays allow, the way they bury those acorns allows oaks to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. Uh, jays do store acorns for winter food. They don't cache them, so they're not burying a whole bunch in the same place. They bury them singly. They can carry more than one at a time, but they bury them singly and individually. So what they do is they pick up an acorn, then they fly up to a mile from the parent tree. And that's the key. No other uh, acorn disperser moves acorns that far. Then they tap it below the surface of the, of the ground. If they think another jay uh, has watched them do that, uh, then they will wait a few minutes and they'll, they'll dig up the acorn and move it to a new stop, spot because jays know that jays steal acorns uh, and they do it very stealthily. And of course, the object is, is for uh, the jay to get the acorn during the winter and have something to eat. But here's the key. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall but they only remember where one out of every four acorns is. So in essence, a single jay is planting 3,360 oak trees each year. Uh, and of course, if a jay gets, gets uh, killed or eaten by a, by a, a hawk, then they're planting 4,500 uh, uh, new oak trees every, every year. Uh, so the, because of their poor memory, oaks get uh, an awful lot of, of service out of it. And of course, it's not just blue jays that are doing this, jays all over the country. And we have seven or eight species of jays. This is the scrub jay in, in Oregon doing exactly the same thing. Okay, in November, uh, you might have, have realized that it was either a really good year for acorns or not such a good year for acorns. Uh, and during good years, we call that a masting year Typically members of a particular group like the white oak group or the red oak group all produce their acorns in uh, at the same time. Uh, and that's unusual for uh, trees. Trees often produce, sometimes they have good years, but they often produce their, their fruit uh, a lot more evenly. So the question is why? Why do oaks do it uh, so unevenly? A whole lot one year and then almost none the next year, maybe a couple years in a row. Why mass? There are four hypotheses. Uh, one, it would be predator satiation, followed closely by predator reduction. Those two are, are linked. Uh, improved pollination and energy partitioning. Let's look at each one of those hypotheses. Remember all those things that are eating acorns, like the acorn weevil, there's the acorn weevil. Um, they can get really numerous. You can have 90% of the acorns of a, of a tree infested with acorn weevils. And if, if trees, if oaks made acorns at the same density every single year, the acorn weevil population and the squirrels and everything else that depends on acorns would stabilize around that number and they'd eat almost every single one. But if the oaks make a whole lot of acorns one year, it causes a population explosion of 
the, the acorn eaters. But the following year, there'll be almost no acorns. And then those, those predators, um, the populations crash. The predators actually dry off, die off. Uh, so now you have very few acorn predators around. You can go two or three years with a, a low uh, acorn production. Then you have another mass year and it's easily swamps the, the size of the acorn predator population because there's just not enough of them around. So that really irregular production of, of acorns is uh, what allows uh, many of those acorns to escape predation. Improved pollination, you know, oaks are, are wind pollinated, which is, that's just by chance that the pollen from the male catkins actually reaches the female flowers. They've got to be on a different tree because the uh, male flowers of one tree uh, precede the production of the female flowers on that same tree. So the pollen has to blow around and the more pollen there is blowing around at the same time, the chances of, of successful pollination improve. Then finally, energy allocation. There's usually not enough energy to go around. So oaks either use it for growth or they use it for egg, egg corn production, but they rarely do both in the same season. And by the way, if you wonder whether oaks can have a good fall color, this is the scarlet oak. They certainly can have good fall color. Um, so those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be happening at the same time and they would explain why oaks mast. In December, you might realize that uh, particularly in the white oak group, many of the leaves are still on the tree. I mean, this is a deciduous tree. Why didn't it drop its leaves like other deciduous trees? Well, that's a condition called marcescence where the uh, leaves are being held. They held, hold them all winter long. Uh, and it's much more common on young trees and much more common on the lower branches of, of trees. So again, we have to explain why do we have marcescence and the leading hypothesis here is that it wasn't that long ago when uh, North America, uh, Eurasia were loaded with very large Pleistocene mammals. There were three, this, this is the group of mammals that was in Mexico alone. Three species of mammoths. There were uh, giant sloths that were, could reach up 18 feet. These were big guys. And many of them were uh, browsers. Browsers are like white-tailed deer. They eat the buds on woody plant material. Um, that are overwintering. They're very nutritious. Um, but if there are dead leaves surrounding those buds, then it's not such a nutritious meal. It's hard to get at the buds without having a mouthful of dead leaves. So the thought is that marcescence was a way of protecting those buds from these, these very hungry predators or herbivores. And the way marcescence distributes itself supports that because you have dead leaves on the branches only about 18 feet up, the top of the, of the trees or even larger trees don't have any leaves being held on there. So if there's no, no uh, giant mammals that could reach up there, no reason to hold your leaves up there. <coughs> Marcescence also gives oak, oaks an important landscape attribute that uh, other deciduous trees don't have. And that is they can be screens. You can use them as screens during the winter time because they're gonna hang on to their, their leaves during the winter time, at least the white oak group. Uh, and uh, so if you don't want to look at your neighbor, even in the wintertime, you can use a deciduous tree if it's an oak. Okay, January. Uh, it's cold. Not much is happening outside, we typically think. But, you know, if we, if we go out and we look up into the branches of an oak tree, a lot of times we do see some activity from birds. Things like uh, our, our uh, kinglets. This is the yellow crown kinglet. Uh, and the, the uh, ruby can kinglet and there are, are uh, chickadees and titmice. Now chickadees and titmice are common birds that are feeders. They're eating seed all winter long, but only about 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% of their diet is insects and spiders. Um, and kinglets are entirely insectivorous. They should have migrated because uh, they're going to have to find insects all, all winter long. And that seems like a tough thing to do. Now, entomology, I'm an entomologist. I've been an entomologist uh, my entire career. And we all know that there are no insects up in the trees uh, during the wintertime because there's no green leaves to eat. So that's, that's a barren landscape up there. So the big question is, what are these guys eating? What do they think they're doing up there? Well, Bern Heinrich asked the same question. Uh, he's a wonderful naturalist that retired at this point, but he still writes the natural history uh, a, a, uh, an article for a natural, a natural history magazine every month. 
Uh, he's always asking questions. He thinks outside the box. Why uh, are, are birds foraging in the trees? So he cut open, he looked in the crops of uh, yellow crowned kinglets in Maine in January and found out that they were full of caterpillars. So the kinglets, and those are caterpillars that he had eaten that day. Kinglets are getting caterpillars in Maine in January when the caterpillars aren't supposed to be there, but they are there. They're there looking just like sticks, um, particularly on the oaks. Uh, they spend the entire winter looking like sticks. I climbed one of my oak trees uh, two years ago, I guess, uh, to get a vine off of it. And when I came down, this was in November, uh, my shirt had caterpillars all, all over it. So um, they are up there. When it gets cold, they have antifreeze proteins in their cells. It keeps their cells from bursting. Uh, so they shrink a little bit when it's cold, and then they swell a little bit when it gets warmer, but they spend the entire winter just sitting there. And that's what those birds are eating. So the next question is, uh, why are they doing that? Most insects overwinter as eggs or as chrysalids or pupae, uh, cocoons. Some uh, overwinter as adults, but very few overwinter as, as larvae. Uh, and, you know, who knows why? But uh, again, the hypothesis is that these, these uh, late instar larvae, they have almost completed their development, are ready to go when the leaves pop out in the spring. So they can outcompete anything else. Those little eggs that are just hatching into tiny little caterpillars. Those bigger larvae, the ones that survive, are there and they can uh, get a jump on all that new foliage and complete their development. Okay, February. February is uh, the quietest uh, biological time of, of the year. So let's spend February talking about landscaping myths. There are a lot of myths associated with using oaks in our, our human dominated landscapes. And of course, myths are, are uh, you know, they're often based on at least partly on, on truth. So um, you hear all the time, oaks are too expensive to, to uh, use. They grow too slowly to use in our landscapes. I hear all the time, I'm not gonna live long enough to appreciate my oak. Uh, they get too big to use in small lots, and if you do use them, they're going to fall over and crush your house, or they're going to lift up your sidewalk or your driveway. What is the truth uh, associated with each one of those landscaping myths? Well, are oaks too expensive? They can be, if you insist on planting a big oak. Uh, a big oak uh, will be delivered to your house, but it's going to cost you $3,000, and it also has a 50% chance of dying. When you buy an oak of any size in, in a nursery, if it's been grown in a pot, it is undoubtedly root bound. Remember, oaks have big root systems. When they're stuck in a pot, they grow around and around and around. And if you plant that, um, those roots will continue to grow and, and choke. They'll strangle each other and the tree will die in, in just a few years. So never buy a large potted plant of anything because uh, it's going to be root bound. And this is what happens when you plant root-bound oaks. This was a planting that uh, they put in in a park system in Newark, Delaware a couple of years ago. Um, this is the middle of summer. Every single one was dead. I don't know how much money they wasted on that, but they insisted on planting uh, big trees to get instant gratification. Instead, they got no gratification at all. Another option is to put in bald and burlap trees. Uh, so the, rather than having it in a pot, they're grown in the soil, and, but then the roots are trimmed off and they're wrapped up in, in burlap and then you plant that. Um, it's tough. It's hard on the, on the plants, and they also have a high, high mortality rate. If I planted an acorn the same day I planted one of these big guys, which is going to cost a lot of money, um, these, the first thing they're going to do is sit there and try to rebuild that root system. They'll spend a decade not growing at all, trying to rebuild the roots that we have chopped up. And this acorn, in the meantime, is going to grow and uh, become a taller, faster a taller tree, much healthier, with a big root system, uh, and certainly live much longer than this, this one that we, we chopped all its roots off for. Uh, it does take a while, so you have to have a little patience, but and then you will end up with a much healthier tree. This is a good size to plant an oak. And of course, nurserymen don't want to sell them at that size because they can't charge you very much, but you will get a healthy tree. Uh, well, do oaks grow too slowly? If you plant a little oak like that, you know, are you going to be dead before it becomes a tree? A lot of people think that. So let's have a race between this is the white oak I planted as an acorn in our, our front yard here. <clears throat> it's six years old uh, right now, so it's already grown a little bit. Now, this is my friend Bella. She's two years old. Everybody thinks she's, she's uh, our daughter. She was not our daughter. She's our friend of ours daughter, but she spent a lot of time in our house. She was actually born on my wife's birthday. 
Uh, and this was Bella's favorite tree. So let's have a race between Bella and the oak tree. And the oak tree has a little, little head start here, but Bella's, Bella's a human. She can grow really fast. So here it is. The tree is six years old, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Bella's losing. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, there you go, 2020, Bella has her mask on, so you know what year it is. Um, she has clearly lost the race with, with uh, her favorite oak tree. Uh, and she's pretty tall. She's very tall. She's taller than me, and, and you know how tall I am. Uh, so oaks do grow. Uh, you know, a, we, this is still a baby, but uh, it's, it's only been 20. This is 20-year-old oak, and, uh, you know, people think it's a lot older than that because they grow. And this is a white oak, by the way. White oaks are supposed to be really slow growing. Not so. But you don't have to wait until your oak is large before it starts to contribute ecologically to your yard, particularly contributing to your food web. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves and here's a, a uh, caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that plant. They contribute to your food web immediately and they contribute a whole bunch. We'll talk more about that later. Are oaks too large to use in small houses or small yards? These are two red oaks in very small yards. I drive by them on the way to uh, work in, in Newark, Delaware. They probably were planted the same time this house was, was built, and it's probably more than 100 years ago. Uh, and they haven't fallen over the house yet. You're never going to get a landscape designer to recommend a large tree for a space that small. But they've served that house very well. They've lowered the temperature around that house at 10 degrees. Uh, during the hot, hot days. Remember, in the old days, there were no air conditioners. That was an important feature. Uh, and they also protected from, from winter winds. But again, nobody's going to suggest that. Here's a, a very large oak next to a very large church. Unfortunately, they didn't chop the oak down when they, when they built the church. But uh, it can be done on very small properties. Point is, there are lots of small oaks that you could use. Uh, uh, we've got to get more of them into the, the marketplace. In the East, dwarf chestnut oak is the most common one that, that you can buy, Quercus prinoides. Georgia oak is in and out of the, the trade in the, in the South. But uh, there are, are several uh, options and many more options in, uh, in the West. Some of these are actually ground covers. So, um, so we need to get them in the, in the trade so that even small houses can have the, the option of using oaks. This is my, my chestnut, my dwarf chestnut oak. It produces acorns when it's five feet tall. I'm looking down on it uh, here to take this picture. Another option is to, uh, you can have small oaks in your yard if you, if you coppice them. So this is a red oak uh, that uh, was maybe four inches in diameter. Uh, and then somebody cut it off and, and uh, it grew back as a bush. That's what coppicing is. People used to do it all the time to get uh, um, thin diameter uh, wood. It was very common forestry practice, uh, but don't do it anymore. But you could, you could have an oak bush if you do it. And every time it gets too tall, cut it off again and it comes back. You got good fall color here. Uh, you're getting the benefits, the, the food web benefits that oak leaves present. So it's a different way of getting small oaks in, in small spaces that we're not taking advantage of, but we could. Will oaks crush your house? Uh, you know, they could, they could. And of course, we hear on, on the news, anytime one does anywhere, we hear about it and it gives us the impression that trees are crushing houses every single day. Uh, and they're doing that because of the way we plant them. We plant almost all of our trees as specimen trees. We want them to get as big and spread out and not compete with any, anything else. So we plant them isolated. That means the root system cannot um, interlock with uh, another tree's root system. So when you get a, a wet, windy period, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest though. They're close enough together that the root systems all interlock. It forms a, an, a, a very stable matrix. So when the big winds come, they don't uh, blow over. If you look at a stream cut, this is the way roots are interlocking with each other. The stream is taking the soil away. So we've got one, two, three, four trees here. Uh, very, very stable. A tornado might snap them off, but it's not going to blow them over. So rather than, than this approach, let's try what I call oak groves. Here's uh, two white oaks. Actually, these are the two down the street that we got the uh, acorn from when we first moved in. Those, they're three feet apart. Uh, I'm sure they were here before they put this road in, but they're very stable. They haven't fallen over. Neither one is as big as it would be when it's isolated, but you view them as a, as a group. 
Um, here are three oaks right next to each other called the Three Sisters in Northwest Connecticut. Uh, so this is this is the way oaks often do it in the, the forest. Now this is a planned landscape. This is at Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. It's one of the DuPont estates. Big red oak back here. These are hemlocks. Uh, so this, this grove was planted um, sometime after the 30s, not sure, sure when. Uh, here are rhododendrons down here, and they're big rhododendrons and some hardscape. So this is a, a, a grove of trees, but it's all, all planned. It looks like a natural forest, extremely stable. And this is the way we can, can um, get a lot more trees into our landscape in a stable way. It's a good way to reduce your lawn, by the way. Will oaks lift up our sidewalks and our, our hard, hardscape? Uh, they can. Uh, it depends on what, what they're growing on and what species you have. So willow oaks, for example, have pretty shallow root systems. Uh, they often do lift up hardscape. But this is a pin oak right next to the road going down. There's good deep soil here, no problem. Here are two red oaks, uh, again, at the University of Delaware. Look at that, right next to the curb, not lifting it up at all. If you plant an oak over bedrock, the roots have to go laterally. So yes, they'll lift up anything. If you plant it over an agricultural pan, you know, a lot of our developments uh, used to be agriculture. A pan is where the, the plow went down uh, maybe 12, 18 inches for a century. And the, the land beneath that is, is really compact. The roots will grow along the top of that pan if you don't break it up and that can lift up hardscape. But break up your pan, make sure you get deep enough soil and your oaks won't lift up anything. Okay, it is now March. Uh, the leaves are finally dropping. So Mars Essence is giving up for this, the season. So you're creating leaf litter on, on the ground. Good time to talk about leaves once they fall from the trees. First of all, there's a whole lot of variation in what oak leaves look like. This is just uh, some of the variety we'll see. There's variation uh, within a single tree in size. So this is a juvenile leaf. Here's a mature leaf. Um, many oaks in the West look like uh, holly leaves. Many of them look like uh, willow leaves. That's the willow oak. Um, so a lot of variation in oak leaves. A big tree can produce 700,000 leaves every season. And if you laid them out next to each other, that would cover four tennis courts with leaves. And that, of course, is what happens when the leaves fall. They get laid out on the ground and they form a blanket over our very valuable soil community. They slowly break down, returning nutrients to the soil. Uh, and that is what the tree is going to use to grow in, in the future. So you've got to have your soil covered with um, mulch of some kind. Leaf litter is the best. Living mulch growing on top of that leaf litter is, is wonderful. But the reason you want your soil covered is because the soil community depends on high humidity, damp, damp soil, and, and lower temperatures. You don't want the sun to bake uh, the, your soil. You don't want the rain to, to uh, erode it away. So bare soil is an ecological no-no, and that's, that's what leaf litter does. It protects it. Oak leaf litter is better than other leaves because it takes up to three years for oak leaves to break down. Uh, they're filled with tannins and lignans, and they're very, very stable. So your leaf, your, your soil is always protected as opposed to maples or birches or, or tulip tree leaves, they break down, they don't even make it through the first summer. And then you do have, have bare soil. Uh, why do we wanna protect the, the soil community? Because there are more species that are found in the soil uh, underground than there are above ground. Uh, and they are the detritivores. There's what, they are what, what is recycling the uh, nutrients, um, creating a steady state system on your, your property. So the oak, uh, makes leaves, the leaves fall down, they break down, the oak brings up the nutrients and makes more leaves, and it can go on forever without any inputs from you. Can your plants grow through oak leaf litter? Of course they can. Here's a, a fern. It's not a planting, this is natural. Um, you know, how do the plants survive in the old days without us raking all the leaves away? They're very good at getting through, through leaf litter. Uh, are the the uh, living community underneath an oak tree is fantastically diverse uh, and in abundance. Now, all the creatures are, are tiny, but there's a lot of them. There's 250,000 mites per square meter uh, in, under an oak tree, 100,000 springtails. These are little uh, spinthurin columbulans, but there's lots of species of springtails. Uh, 90,000 proturans, those are very primitive insects. You need a microscope to see them well. 
a million nematodes. So tremendous numbers when we allow the leaf litter to protect this very valuable community. And of course, all the fungal community, the hyphae and the, the uh, mycorrhizal communities that allow nutrients to enter the roots of our, our trees. There are a few butterflies that specialize, believe it or not, on oak leaf litter. Like the banded hair streak, that's what it eats as a caterpillar. It eats these dead leaves. I've never found a caterpillar. They're tough to find down there, but the, the adults are pretty common at, at our house. Uh, there are 70 species of moths that we call litter moths that eat leaf litter, not just oak leaf litter, but they certainly like that. Like the ambiguous uh, litter moth, the America, American idea, the dark spotted palthus and 67 other species. So when we rake up our leaves, when we mulch them with our mower, when we throw them out as if they're trash, we're throwing out all, all that life along, along with them. And of course, any cocoons that are in the tree um, or any, any caterpillars that are in the tree and come down into the leaf litter, they'll spin a cocoon um, in order to make it through the winter. They're in your leaf litter as well. And you're throwing that out as well when you do that. Then you've got all the predators that eat that, the, the creatures that are in the, uh, uh, the soil community. I didn't even mention annelids, worms, of course, they're, they're valuable. Spiders, other things that, that uh, make up a very complex community. So we wanna protect our, the, the ground with our very valuable oak leaves. Okay, April is the time that buds first break. On, on our trees. And it's also the time that you get to, to, it's a chance for you to see the most ephemeral interaction, one of the most ephemeral interactions that happens in all of nature. It takes about five minutes each year. Uh, and that is when sinipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the uh, expanding buds of oak trees. This is a, and they form, they form galls. So this is a female sinipid wasp. That's her little ovipositor there. She's injecting an egg into the bud. This is a male that is riding her. He's not mating with her now. He already mated with her, uh, but he wants to stay with her because after she lays this egg, she's gonna mate again. This is a male that wishes he would go away so that he gets a chance to, to mate. So what she does when she's laying her egg in the, in the uh, bud is to lay the egg, but she also injects it with plant hormones which directs the growth of the cells. The cells in an expanding bud are like stem cells. They can turn into anything. Uh, the oak tree wants them to turn into uh, leaves and, and new branches, but the, the gall wasp wants it to turn into a gall. So a gall is a species specific shape, which is a compromise between what the oak wants and what the, the wasp wants. People liken it to a, a uh, cancerous growth, I don't like that analogy because cancer cells just grow like crazy and they never stop. Cell, uh, the cells of galls are, uh, the growth is extremely controlled and every single species of gall wasp makes a unique type of gall. So here's a, a female gall wasp laying in uh, one of the buds of my trees this past spring. And that's the gall that resulted from it. I put a little string around it so I could keep track of it. There are 5,000 species of sinipid gallers worldwide uh, on oaks. A single oak tree can support 70 species of, of gallers. And that's, that's a um, oak gall, another one back there. So they can be quite pretty. Many of them are hollow, which is interesting. If you cut open, this is an apple oak gall. The actual galler, the larva of that little wasp is in this center, uh, very, very uh, hard sphere right now. So you'd have to cut that open to find it. But then you've got all this, this open space here. Uh, why is that? Why did they make that? Well, it turns out that, that sinipid gallers have more natural enemies than any other type of, of insects. More natural enemies in the, in the form of parasitoid, parasitic wasps that lay their eggs in the sinipid galler. So this is one of them, a pterymid wasp, and it's got a very long ovipositor here. So the distance between the larva itself and the outside of the gall has to be bigger than the length of the ovipositor of the natural enemies that want to lay eggs in here. Uh, so there's a period when this is expanding where it's not bigger and the, the parasitoid can actually reach this, but that's why the gall grows very quickly to create a safe spot for the gallers larva. Gall variety is fantastic. Um, many of them look like plant diseases. Each one of these is, has a different galler inside of them. There are 536 species of plant galls west of the Rockies. Most of them are uh, sinipid gallers. 
on oak trees. Some of them grow on the leaves themselves, other grows, grow on the stems, uh, and then they just have all kinds of crazy shapes. Um, again, look like plant diseases, some look like pottery, some look like brains. This is a uh, one of the large galls on uh, Quercus gariana, the Oregon oak, Oregon white oak, um, very common out west. And Gauls have had an interesting input to our own recorded history. It turns out if you if you grind up a gall like this, that hole, by the way, is where the gauler has left. It's, it's chewed its way out of the gall. If you grind up the gall itself and mix it with some chemicals, it forms an indelible black ink. Uh, and we humans discovered that thousands of years ago. And it turns out that all of our important recorded history was made with gall ink. The Bible was written with gall ink, the Magna Carta, Gaul Inc., the Declaration of Independence, all everything that the, the monks and the scribes did in the Middle Ages was done with Gaul Inc. Just a little tidbit. Okay, April is also the best time to find polyphemus cocoons on your oak if you're lucky enough to have one. After the marcescent leaves fall, you can see the cocoons very clearly. They're pretty large, they're silvery. Uh, and the, uh, what they contain, of course, is uh, one of the giant silk moths, the polyphemus moth. That's what the caterpillar looks like. It's like a big sausage. Uh, it's one of the favorite foods of, of cardinals. Um, and that's what the uh, adult looks like. It's the second largest of our, our uh, giant sil silk moths. And in most parts of the country, they are declining. Uh, so if you have one on your, your property, um, that's that's a great find. Why are they declining? A couple reasons, but one of them is we, you know, they're attracted to our lights at night, and then they get picked up by bats and other predators. Um, so turn off your lights at night. You might have some polyphemus moths. Okay, in May uh, you get complete leaf expansion of of uh, the leaves on your your oak. It's when the biological season really gets gets underway. So these leaves. Uh, all over the temperate zone, of course, are expanding very rapidly. And close on the, the heels of that expansion comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And close on the heels of those caterpillars comes the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is no coincidence that, that birds migrate up from Central and South America during the spring, right when uh, you get the peak emergence of the caterpillars that eat, eat the leaves. It's also no coincidence that most of those migrating birds go to oaks any chance they get. Any birder worth his salt knows that if you're gonna look for warblers, you go to oaks because that's where they are. Why are they there? It's where most of the food is. Uh, I had a student several years ago now, Christy Beal, who compared the um, number of minutes warblers were foraging in the spring on different plant families uh, in big trees in cemeteries. This first bar here where most of the warblers were most of the time is the Fagaceae, that's where the oaks are. So the Fagaceae contains the oaks, American chestnut and, and beech. Uh, there were no chestnuts or beeches in her, her uh, study sites, so they were all oaks, and oaks outcompeted everything else. These are pines, these are birches, and so on. So again, why are they there? That's where, that's where the food is. And the food we're talking about is, is caterpillars, things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher, the lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampi, the oblique heterocampi, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, hickory tussock moth, red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. They're called slug caterpillars because their head's tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the uh, spiny oak caterpillar, the spun glass slug caterpillar, which is my favorite. I think it's the prettiest in the whole country. And literally hundreds, hundreds more species use oaks. Uh, this is what my house looks like uh, today. Like we're moving into fall now, but I've got a little long hair, um, but I put an awful lot of the, the plants back. And four years ago, I decided to, to um, take a picture of every species of moth I could find that's making a living on our, uh, in our yard now because I put these plants back, which is a reflection of how uh, stable and large our food web is. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of, of uh, 
plant eater. So if you know the number and diversity of, of caterpillars in your, in your yard, then you know how, how large your food web is and how many things can be supported. So, so far, and this is an old number, it's old by two days, um, up to 1,140 species of moths that I have photographed in my yard and almost 30% of them are using oaks. Then we have 10 acres uh, and I live in Pennsylvania, which is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land mass, uh, we have 44% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. And we have them because we put the plants back, mostly oaks. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Do you remember what a keystone is? This is the Roman arch. The keystone is a stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Well, I call these plants keystone plants because if you take them out of the local food web, the food web collapses. That's because just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives our, our food webs. So I think of the, the keystone plants uh, in, in the ecological houses that we all need to build on our properties as the two by fours of those houses. They're holding them up. You cannot build a, a house out of, out of wallpaper. So make sure you've got lots of keystone plants, particularly oaks. Oaks are in the mid-Atlantic states support 557 species of caterpillars and that includes New York. 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. So in 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks are the number one keystone plant, the most valuable plant you can put into your landscape. Which oaks are best? Uh, people ask me this all the time, so I actually had a, a student look at it this, this summer comparing uh, insect use of, he did 16 species of oaks, but some didn't have enough replicates. Uh, so these are the species he had enough data for. Uh, and it turns out that uh, first, all the oaks are, are really good. So there's not a huge difference among them. White oaks were a little bit better than, than the others. This is black oak, uh, red oak. All of these oaks here are, are not, you can't distinguish them from, from each other. The only oaks that didn't do well were the oaks that were outside of their, their uh, natural range. So this is, uh, this guy's water oak down here and, and willow oak. Uh, we are above the range of, of uh, water oaks. Some people plant them anyway. And willow oaks were at the very northern part of their range. So we're above the area where most of the species that use those trees actually occur. This is uh, Quercus acutissima from China. This is the sawtooth oak. Uh, it had less herbivory too, but um, it had more than I thought it was going to have. China oak, what are things eating China oak for? Well, I asked my, my student, it turned out what was eating the, the, the uh, sawtooth oak was Japanese beetle, which is from Asia as well. Japanese beetles were common only on um, the, the Chinese oak. So. so I would pick oaks based more on soil type and diseases you might want to, to dodge rather than which ones are going to support the most biodiversity because they're all very good. Actually, just, just to compare, 550 cents of species of caterpillars on oaks in the mid-Atlantic states. On tulip trees, 21 species. That's the, the type of difference we're talking about. Uh, crepe myrtles, zero. Um, Bradford pear, zero. So huge differences here. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Well, the birds need so many caterpillars. And I'm just talking about birds because people like birds. There's lots of things that eat them. Uh, chickadees, for example, require 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get one clutch to the point where they, they leave the nest. And that depends on the number of, of chicks in the nest. Um, and after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you aren't gonna, you're not going to have birds if we plant the plants like ginkgo that support zero caterpillars uh, in our yards. We won't be able to, to have enough caterpillars to feed all those birds. That's why we want them in our food web. Okay, June. June uh, this year, of course, was the year of the cicada. I guess you guys did not have cicadas up there, but we, we sure did. We had the 17-year the cicada, periodical cicadas come in two forms, 17-year or 13-year. And we had the 17-year the brood, which was actually three species that come out around our house. That's what they look like. Our annual cicadas are, are etched in black and green. The uh, periodical cicadas are in orange and, and red. Uh, and of course, the media had a lot of fun with this. The media loves to vilify nature. 
uh, and, and it was described, it was going to be a terrible scourge and we should all uh, be terrified because they're going to be everywhere and they're going to be so loud that it'll drive us crazy and we'll kill our babies and they call it an invasion. It's none of those things. It, it's one of the most fantastic biological events that, that you're ever going to be privileged to see. So the next emergence at my house, I'm going to be 87 years old, so I'm glad I got to, to uh, enjoy this one. It was a big one. Uh, this was good. This was a tree at the University of Delaware. There were a lot of cicadas that came out. And when they come out, they aerate, aerate the soil. So you don't have to hire anybody to do that. Uh, they, they, uh, it's wonderful for the, the health of the tree. But there were a lot of them. But it also brought in some interesting birds. Mississippi kite, 11 Mississippi kites, flew to Newark, Delaware, stayed there for two weeks. Everybody got to enjoy the Mississippi kites who came to eat the cicadas. Here's the uh, life cycle very quickly. They crawl out at night uh, and split their, their skin, then emerge. Uh, looks like they're going to fall out, but they swing up and hang on to the top of their, their exuviae here. And then they, these guys are like soft-shelled crabs now. They're totally vulnerable, so they have to hang there till their, their exoskeleton hardens. And when it hardens, they have their regular color. Then they can fly away, uh, and the males start to sing. They go, and a lot of them do it, and they do it all day long. But what they're doing is advertising how 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 great a male they are to to females. They're saying, "Come mate with me." Uh, the females typically go to the loudest ones because that genetically they are the highest quality. They do mate with them, and then the female lays her eggs in twigs. So here's a twig of a, a pin oak, uh, and there's the ovipositor. She's jamming it in. Take a pin someday and try to jam it into an oak twig. It's hard to do, but the cicadas have no trouble doing that. She jams it in, she lays an egg, there she is uh, farther in, lays an egg and then moves right down the stem laying uh, a number of eggs in a row. Those eggs then hatch, the little guys parachute to the ground, tunnel into the ground and will spend 17 years drinking the xylem out of the roots of the tree that they, the eggs were laid in. Uh, but from the point where the eggs are laid out, uh, it, it often kills the branch. That's called flagging. And again, oh, the, the cicadas are going to kill our trees. They're not going to kill your tree. This is, this is nature's pruning, and it only happens one every, once every 17 years. Your trees will do just fine with it. Uh, I had another student look at which trees uh, the cicadas were preferring when they laid their eggs. The green bars are the ones that had the most flagging, and they, they all were oaks. Red oak, white oak, willow oak, here was pin oak down, down here, uh, and then maples and other things were, were less preferred. Um, so there is a slight preference towards, towards oaks. And then they die, and that's it for another 17 years. Why do they spend 17 years underground? Same thing. It's predator satiation. They are avoiding, if they come out in such uh, large numbers that there are not enough predators around, like my friend the squirrel here, to eat them all, then many will escape predation and be able to lay their eggs and complete their life history. July is the month that uh, if you go out at night, you hear a chorus of singing, singing creatures, singing creatures that we call Katie Dids. Um, I used to, to uh, do a lot of camping when I was young and the Katie did singing at night would sing me to sleep. It's one of my favorite, favorite uh, songs. What happens is they, that's again, it's the males singing to attract females and they, they lift their wings up and rub them back and forth on these really sclerotized part, parts and the different species make, make different sounds. Um, so this is, this is why they're doing it. Uh, once upon a time, this is a true story, by the way, there was a woman named Katie who fell in love with a very handsome young man. Uh, alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer they solved the mystery by singing, Katie did, Katie did. One of my favorite sounds. That's what a female Katie did looks like. Just before she's mature, the wings haven't expanded yet, but she's got her ovipositor ready to go. There are four species of Katie dids that frequent our, our oak forests, spend most of the time up in the canopy, so we don't usually see them till the end of the, the year. Here's a female with her, her wings totally developed. And they take that ovipositor and lay their eggs, glue them to the side of twigs. These ones have already hatched, but if you see these big flat eggs glued to a side of a twig, 
those arcadiated eggs. Okay, August, uh, you know, we're getting on in the summer. From the moment egg, oak leaves expand right through the, the year, they get tougher and tougher each day. That's a defense against all those things that are, that are eating oaks. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very tough time for, for leaf chewers. And one way to get around that is through gregarious feeding. This is the yellow neck caterpillar. And they have found that when everybody eats together, all those little mouths can get through that tough, tough material. That's what they look like when they're, they're older. Uh, and they will eat a lot of leaf material. It's a common defense uh, or, or uh, adaptation against tough oak leaves. This is the uh, orange humped oak worm. There's the pink striped oak worm. So gregarious feeding is very common in August. Uh, I counted 115 yellow net caterpillars on our oak tree uh, uh, one year, actually back in 2014. I did it just on the, the lower branches here. Uh, but you know, you can't see any of the leaf damage that they made. You can't see any of those caterpillars. Uh, but if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 115 yellow net caterpillars eating your tree, most people would grab the, the spray can, call the man, kill the, kill the thing. They're going to hurt my tree. They're not going to hurt your tree. Your tree is totally adapted to this type of caterpillar damage. And because it tolerates it, you have living things in your yard that depend on those, those caterpillars. I met a woman in New Orleans. Tammany Bomb Garden uh, several years ago, and she suggested that we all practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. And I think that's, that's great advice. That's the distance at which we typically view our, our trees. So it's not an aesthetic problem to support some life. Another way to get around tough tissues is to become a leaf miner. You eat the stuff in between the tough parts, the, the upper uh, and lower epidermis, that's where all the toughness is, but the, the middle layers, the palisade mesophyll, the parenchymal cells are nice and soft and tasty, and that's where the nutrition is. But if you're gonna be a leaf miner, you have to be really small and really thin. Uh, two kinds of mines, a serpentine mine, so the egg was laid here and the larva hatched and, and tunneled through here. As it got bigger, it made a wider mine. The black thing in the middle, that's, that's its poops. It's laying, laying all of its little poops there called frass. And then it pupated here. Uh, as opposed to a blotch mine, there's the caterpillar right in there. You can just barely see it. And it goes in a circle and makes a, a blotch wider and wider. There it is backlit. And there it is with a really nice photo by Salvador Batanza. Um, doesn't look much like a caterpillar because it's got to be adapted for mining between those, those uh, two layers of leaves, but it does look like a moth when it comes out. This is one of the Chamomaria species that eats oaks, the solitary oak leaf miner, the gregarious oak leaf miner, oak tentiform leaf miner. There are a lot of species that, that are leaf miners to get around oak leaf toughness in August. Uh, August is a very dangerous time to be a caterpillar because the enemies of caterpillars have become, uh, their population sizes have grown very large. So this is a, a yellow uh, striped oak worm, and this is a potter wasp that has just stung it and paralyzed it. And it's going to carry it off and put it in its, its uh, oak, its um, mud nest. They're called potter wasps because they make these, these pottery-like mud nests and then stuff them full of caterpillars. Then they lay an egg on it. The egg hatches and eats the caterpillar alive. It seems pretty gruesome. Um, and I guess for the caterpillar, it is. But this is a form of refrigeration. You know, we get meat and we put it in the refrigerator so it doesn't spoil. Uh, well, the wasp doesn't have a refrigerator. So he, he, she paralyzes the wasp and that keeps the, the um, caterpillar from rotting before the egg even hatches. And he keeps it fresh during the entire time that its larva is, is eating this caterpillar. It's a great adaptation. These are eggs of the yellow net caterpillar. Dangerous time to be an egg. Minutes after they were laid by the adult moth, a, a tiny little parasitic wasp, probably an inserted wasp, came and started laying eggs in the caterpillar eggs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and here's when those, uh, the babies of that, that uh, wasp were emerging. They're not babies, they're adults at this point, but they've eaten a good portion of that, that um, egg mass. And this is what keeps numbers down. This is why when you grab the spray can, the first thing you kill are all these natural enemies. And that actually increases the uh, size of the caterpillar population. This is a tachinid wasp. 
Tachinid fly, uh, it's a large family of flies, thousands of species. They all are, are parasitoids, most of them on, on caterpillars. They lay their eggs on the outside of a caterpillar. That's a little tachinid egg right there. It's going to hatch and tunnel into this, this caterpillar. This is a saddleback caterpillar, and it's got three problems. It's got this tachinid egg here. It's got a tachinid larva that's already inside of it. That's its breathing tube. Uh, so it's eating the, the caterpillar uh, inside and then breathing on the outside. And here's a teramelid wasp that is laying eggs in this, this caterpillar. So this guy is dead three times over. This is a contracted Daytana caterpillar with four tachinid eggs on it. These three haven't hatched yet. This one has hatched. It tunnels into the caterpillar and it will kill it. This is a black, black blotch caesura caterpillar, but it has uh, outsmarted the tachinid. It has three white marks on its, its back that look just like tachinid eggs. So the fly comes along and says, oh, you've already been parasitized, I will leave you alone. Another way to avoid predation if you're a caterpillar is to fall off your leaf and suspend yourself from a silken thread. You can't see the thread there, but that's what it's doing. Uh, and wait till the enemy goes away. If you go out at night and you, you uh, stare at your, your uh, oak leaves with a flashlight, you'll see a number of caterpillars hanging from the leaves. They're escaping the natural enemies that are up there hunting them. But some of those, uh, those uh, they're mostly parasitoid wasps, like a braconid wasp here, are very clever. They will lean over the edge, and with their four legs, they'll pull up the silken thread and lay an egg in the caterpillar anyway, or they'll shinny down the silken thread and, and get the caterpillar. So August is a tough time to be a caterpillar. Okay, September, our final month. Um, this is, of course, when we hear crickets all the time. We know about crickets, those black things on the ground that are that are singing. If we get them in our house, it's it's good luck. But there there are bush and tree crickets, which are not black. They're green or yellow, and they can be up on vegetation, including our oaks. That's what a, a tree cricket looks like. Uh, and they're doing the same thing, of course. The males are singing to attract attract females. Uh, and the loudest singers attract the most females. So they want to be uh, the loudest. And typically the loudest singers are the largest males. But these guys are very clever. Um, they find a hole in the leaf or they chew a hole in the leaf of the right size. They stick their head through it, raise their, their wings and sing. And uh, most of these leaves are, are parabolic in shape and it actually projects the sound louder and farther than if they sang on a flat surface. So they're sending the message a false message to the female is saying, I'm a big, loud male, when in fact, they're not big or loud, but they are smart. So the female comes and mates with them. So maybe smartness is, is good enough. August or September is also the time you're most likely to see walking sticks. Uh, these are orthopteroid type insects that uh, are called walking sticks because they look like sticks and they walk. This is uh, a walking stick on an emery oak in Arizona. Um, they spend most of their time up in the canopy uh, during the summer, so we don't see them very often. Sometimes they can get numerous enough to, to uh, do a little bit of defoliation. There's records of that in, in uh, West Virginia. I've never seen it, but usually you don't run into to these very many, very often, um, but interesting insects. Okay, we have walked ourselves through through the year talking about just some of the things uh, that, that are happening on the oaks in our yards. So let me, let me wind up here by reminding you of something you already know. We have a serious biodiversity crisis, and this is a crisis we have created. And it's a crisis not just for the creatures that we're eliminating, it's a crisis for us because those are the creatures that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. If we succeed in eliminating biodiversity on planet Earth, we're going to eliminate ourselves. And I don't like the language. I mean, you hear, oh, the birds are disappearing. The insects are disappearing. We have lost 3 billion birds uh, in the last 50 years. We've got global insect decline, but they're not disappearing. This is not mysterious. We're killing them. We know why they're, they're not there. We're killing them. Earth is now experiencing uh, the sixth great extinction event that it's ever been through, but this is the first one caused by uh, an organism. So it's a global crisis. The good news is it has a grassroots solution. That means it includes all of us. It includes me. It includes you. It includes your neighbors. It includes everybody who doesn't care about it. Everybody is going to have a role in, in, in solving this global crisis. There are four things that every landscape has to accomplish today has to capture carbon. We talked about that. Got to manage the watershed. Everybody lives in a watershed. Nobody has the ethical right to destroy it. 
by the way, big lawns destroy your watershed. Uh, it's got to support a diverse community of pollinators, and it's got to support a complex uh, food web. That's the those are the creatures that um, are are running our our ecosystems. When you plant an oak, you are addressing three of those four goals. Oaks are capturing more carbon than other trees. They're managing the watershed with their huge root systems and their canopy, which blocks heavy rain and 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 uh, prevents soil compaction. Um, so that you get better infiltration. Its big root system is, is um, helping infiltration. They're supporting the most complex food web by making all those caterpillars and all the other things that depend on oaks. The only thing they're not doing is supporting a diverse community of pollinators because they're wind pollinated. But there are uh, a growing number of records of a number of native bees that do use oak pollen in the spring. They just don't pollinate from it. So three maybe three and a half out of four is not bad. But despite these, these very wonderful landscape attributes, oaks are in trouble. The old giants are gone. Those 900 year uh, things, it used to be all over our forest. We, we cut them down first because they gave us the most wood. The percentage of oaks in our Eastern forest has been cut in half in the last century because we've, we've uh, suppressed fire, which encourages oaks rather than discourages them. We've introduced serious pests like the gypsy moth, um, a number of serious diseases that are, are uh, clobbering our oaks. Uh, and we also, uh, we, we, when we harvest trees from the forest, we, we high grade them. In other words, we only take the best trees and leave the worst. So the best trees are the oaks and we've, we've selectively taken them out of our forest. Habitat fragmentation has hindered oak, oak populations or pollination. You know, when you're wind pollinated and you've got tiny little habitat fragments, a lot of times the pollen of your species cannot get from fragment to fragment. So you've got a lot of, of uh, healthy oaks that aren't able to produce uh, acorns. 28 of our 91 North American species are now threatened for those reasons. One third of our global oaks are endangered for those reasons. The Oregon white oak, for example, has lost 97% of its range because it grew in the areas in the West that we have dedicated to agriculture. There are 2,300 species of plants and animals and fungi that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. And of course, they're rebuilding the, the uh, roof of the Notre Dame Cathedral in France, and they're doing it with French oaks, 6,000 of them. 6,000 large French oaks, French oaks are going into building that one, one roof, and that's probably all the oaks in France, I don't know. You know, we humans live out our life during a, a very brief instant ecological time, and we can't return our giant oaks to the landscape during that time, but we can start the process. And much faster than you think, no time at all, our oaks will start to play very important roles in our, our landscapes. They will assume those keystone positions uh, in our yards, right in front of our, our eyes. We all are responsible for good earth stewardship <clears throat> because we all require uh, a healthy earth. We all require healthy ecosystems. That means everybody's got the responsibility. The best way to exercise that responsibility to good earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our emeralds, our prominence, our galls, our weevils, our orthopteroids, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Talamy. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put it in the chat and I will read them to him. Someone said fascinating, incredible presentation. Thank you, Doug. There you go. Okay. Kudos to you. There's one here. Um, oh. in, in the village, I know it came to me directly. Okay. Um, in the village, we um, plant trees in the right of way and we do plant oaks. In fact, we plant white oaks, but um, we keep them fairly far apart because it's a narrow planting strip and this question is whether it's okay to plant them closer so they'll interlock and be more stable or are they going to run out of soil in that strip? 
Uh, it is okay to plant them closer. Just look at the way they grow on any kind of soil in, in the forest. Now they may not get as big and, and you know, spread out as far when you plant them closer, but that's okay. Uh, if you stabilize them and have them not blow over, that's probably better in the long run. Yeah, definitely. And also in terms of in, uh, interlocking their roots, do they do this with other species or just with oaks? Now other species do it as well. And let me, th there's a caveat to this. Oak wilt is a serious disease we have introduced from Central America. And unfortunately, when oaks get it, they do trans move it from one individual to another through the root system. So, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the recommendations if you get oak wilt in your, your forest is to trench around your oak trees so that their roots are not connected. Um, you know, I, I think your oaks get it in the end anyway. The way we're going to get around these diseases, oak wilt and oak leaf scorch, sudden oak death syndrome, is to is to look for trees that are resistant. They have some resistance to it, and those will replace the, the trees that are not resistant. You can fight very hard to save your trees, uh, but if it doesn't have some natural resistance, it's, it's almost impossible. So, um, but keep in mind, somebody will tell you, well, it's going to transfer oak well if you get it. And, and that's true. Well, okay. um, let's see, here's another one. We've had in Mamaroneck, we've been in national news because we were very badly flooded last month. Hmm. And the question is whether oaks and leaving their leaves would have helped avoid having more oaks, because we do have oaks, but if that could have helped mitigate the flooding that we had. Yes, but that's true with an awful lot of plants. Having better planted landscapes, having less lawn, more plants, less impervious surface. So all, all the pavement creates flooding. Anytime water runs off instead of seeps in, you're encouraging flooding. Keep in mind, with climate change, we're getting some crazy weather events. So we are stressing uh, systems even that are perfectly healthy, but it will always be better when you have a better planted system. Okay, so um, let's see. Next well, question. I, I'm sorry, Beverly. Where I, I are you getting separate ones than I am? Because I'm not. I know. I, they, I don't know how this happened, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I just want to sort of go back to where I for. Um, okay. And I apologize if you ask them again. I'm just trying to go all the way back to mine because I'm getting a little okay. confused, but. Um, someone wrote, would planting closer work in a narrow ROW strip? Maybe it's oaks were also on the other side of the sidewalk. Was that? Yeah, we, we did that one. <laughs> okay. What is the best oak to plant? Endangered ones, which are endangered, where do they source? It sounds like the Village of Manic guidelines for planting larger trees at 30 feet apart might be short-sighted. If a seed seeded oak is in a bad place, what's the best time and how to dig it up and put where somewhere it can thrive? Do you have any experience with bare root oak trees for those? <laughs> Let's go one at a time here. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. I thought you were sorry. Yeah. I, I thought those were all um, discussed. No, My no, apologies. No. Okay. Um, what's the best oak to plant? It depends on where oh. you live and what your local diseases are. So at my house, I've got uh, quite a bit of bacterial leaf scorch, which is hitting the red oak group uh, very heavily. So if I want to dodge that, I should plant something in the white oak group. White oak, post oak chestnut oak, dwarf chestnut oak, um, swamp white oak, those are all options that, that won't get the bacterial leaf scorches as, as badly. Um, chestnut oaks really like to be on shallow rocky soil. Uh, so, so if I had shallow rocky soil, I would choose a, a chestnut oak. My favorite is white oak, but that's just a personal favorite. Um, so again, it depends on your, your, your situation. You wanna, if you have a wet area, then you want the pin oak, or, or uh, swamp white oak, um, water oak. Well, you're too far north for water oak, but that's what you want to do is find the oaks that are appropriate for, for your soil type. Okay, great. And then someone had just commented, uh, more of a comment, I think, than a question. It sounds like the village of Marinick, Marinick's guidelines for planting larger trees at 30 feet apart might be short sighted. Well, you know, um, if, if it doesn't matter when they fall over, if they're near structures and things, yeah, planting them closer is going to interlock their, their roots better. Now, oak roots do grow a long way out, um, but the closer they are, the stronger the interlocking is going to be, and 
think about groves as opposed to individuals. That's a safer way to go. Okay. If a self-seeded oak is in a bad place, what's the best time and how to dig, dig it up? As soon as you, as you recognize, the, the best time is, you know, as soon as it germinates. But if, you, if it comes up in the spring, you say, there it is, you know, do it right away. If you leave it uh, even, even two years, it's going to sink a big root system. And um, you can move it, but you'll have to chop off a fair amount of roots to do it. So the sooner the better is the answer to that. Okay. Do you have any experience with bare root oak trees for those looking for immediate gratification? <laughs> Well, yes, but small bare root oak, oak trees. So uh, I planted oaks on my property in two ways, from acorns or from bare root trees. But those, those bare roots were two feet long. Um, they didn't have any, any roots, but I stuck them in the ground. I had really good survivorship. They cost $1.50 each. So it's, you, you know, you don't really get that instant gratification, but I did get very good survivorship and, and um, all those oaks are still, still alive, doing well. And by the way, still alive, I'm talking about 60 feet tall. So um, that's, that's 20 years. Is it older, is it taller than the 20 year old girl that you had in the picture? <laughs> yes, they're taller than you. <laughs> um, hi, wonderful program. Thank you. Would planting oaks and leaving the leaves have helped us with, oh, that was, you read that question right. with our horrible flooding. Um, oaks can't play nicely with cars and because our rocky soil, its root system is compromised when they are planted next to uh, streets and sidewalks, okay? Are post oaks good to plant in a small space? I see them planted in the median of the West Side Highway in Manhattan. Post oaks? Huh, I'm surprised to hear that. Um, they can get big. I would choose one of the smaller ones for a, a median. Um, great place for a dwarf chestnut oak, so. Okay, what effect is Asian jumping worms having on mm. oak forests? Uh, it's the other way around. What effect are oak forests having on, on jumping, Asian jumping worms? Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, all of our worms up this far north are, are, are non-native. Most of them came from Europe very early on, and they play pretty nice. Uh, they, you know, they've aerated our soil. They don't eat all the leaf litter. But in the last, it's probably been 20 years now, we brought over three species of worms from China, uh, which they're called jumping worms because you, when you stamp on the soil, they come wiggling out and it looks like they're, they're jumping. They have not played nice. They eat all the leaf litter. They change the soil chemistry. They eat all the seeds in the soil and they leave it totally bare. And they really devastate that forest, that floor community that, that I was talking about. But they don't like oak leaves. So the more oak leaves you have in your leaf litter, the less problem you will have from Asian jumping worms. It's another good reason to have oaks uh, at common in your in your your forest or your, your yard. Okay, um, 